Hello, my name is Keith Edwards. I'm an instructor for, uh, for Skyline Advanced Technology Services, and uh, I wanted to do a little uh, uh, presentation today uh, about one of those things, one of those little pieces uh, when we talk about IT and give classes like CCNA classes, one of those little things that I think gets left out. It's a matter of putting a couple of things together. And so that's what I'm going to do. I want to put together the conversation about spanning tree and first hop redundancy protocols. Because in most CCNA type classes, they might talk to you about spanning tree. And then later, they might talk to you about first hop redundancy protocols. But I have noticed, and some of my fellow instructors have noticed, that frequently at least in our uh, coming up, uh, frequently they would not have put those two things together. And it's pretty important in terms of design and understanding to put these two together. So that's what we're going to do. So to review the uh, basics just a little bit, in layer two, we talk about using a redundancy protocol to avoid loops, right? Because if we had, as you see in this switch environment, three switches, they're all connected together. And what we can have happen in a situation like that is when a broadcast, an unknown unicast, or a multicast message uh, gets transmitted, the switches may send it over and over amongst each other back and forth because these are a send it out all of my ports type of messaging. And therefore, you might wind up with uh, what's a loop, right? It would go around so much and so much type of traffic could affect it that you might eventually lose uh, the utilization of the equipment as the bandwidth and CPU get overloaded. So we, we don't want that to happen. We want everybody to continue to have services, but we do like redundancy. So we like redundancy, but we don't like loops. So we like something that's going to automatically fail over, but not cause a loop. So what do we use? We use good old fashioned spanning tree. And actually there's lots of spanning trees, so you don't even have to use an old fashioned one comparatively speaking. But the idea is with spanning tree, we can have a design that gives us redundancy, but it automatically heals. So in a normal spanning tree setup, maybe we have these three switches and you see there's a couple of routers and some PCs connected to those switches. And so what will happen is Spanning tree will automatically calculate the root bridge and then it'll calculate the uh, best path for the other switches to get to the root bridge and then it'll block redundant paths in order to avoid a loop. The great thing about this is if something happens to my primary path to the root bridge, spanning tree will realize it and automatically unblock my backup port. So that's one of the beautiful parts about spanning tree is it automatically heals, okay? So it does its job in terms of uh, giving me redundancy, no loops, and auto healing. So this is a great thing about spanning tree. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, first hop redundancy protocols have a similar job in terms of uh, um, stopping there from being a failure, right? So the idea with this is instead of having redundant paths in my layer two environment, I have redundant paths out of my layer two re uh, environment. So what I have here is two routers. Either one can act as the default gateway. Either one can act as the default gateway. Wonderful thing. That we means that during most of the time, in this case, switch one is talking uh, as its default gateway using this router on the left, router A, as the active router. Router A is in active mode. Router B is in standby mode. So this is a wonderful thing. All the people in this switched environment or in this layer two environment, when they want to talk to each other, they can talk to each other via layer two. Anytime somebody in this layer two environment wants to talk to somebody who is in their layer two environment, when they try to send something, for example, to the IP address of somebody who's in their own subnet, well, their IP stack recognizes all the addresses within their subnet 
and then finds out the layer two address of that device within its own subnet and would cause a layer two conversation with whoever's on the, their subnet. However, when you need to talk off of your subnet, what are you going to do? Well, similar, the, the PC or the host will again, based on the destination IP address and the IP stack of the host, recognize that a destination is off of its subnet. So what it's going to do is try to have that layer two conversation with its default gateway. So it's going to send traffic off of its subnet via the default gateway. Well, not the IP address of the default gateway, the MAC address of the default gateway. So what he would do is the PC, if he realizes he has to send something to his default gateway and he did not know the MAC address of his default gateway, he would ARP for it. He would use address resolution protocol to find out the MAC address of his default gateway. And then all the things destined for, in this particular case, you see this server is off of his subnet. He would send everything uh, uh, at layer two to the MAC address of his default gateway. Part of the secret sauce of first hop redundancy protocols like VRRP and HSRP is that they establish, instead of using the physical MAC of one of the routers, they establish a virtual MAC address. And then the person who is active assumes that physical MAC address. Okay, so now I have that physical MAC address as active. Whenever the PC wants to send something off of its subnet, it sends it to the VMAC or the virtual MAC address of the default gateway. Okay? Now, it is true that each of these devices would have a physical IP address, but they would share the um, uh, virtual IP address of the uh, redundancy group. So, something we would do in HSRP very typically, we would give this device the address of 10.1.1.2 and this device the address of 10.1.1.3, but the virtual IP address for the redundancy group would be 10.1.1.1. There are some variations with VRRP that we won't go into, but generally speaking, this is the concept. So what we've got going here is that in this case, the first router is the active router, and the second router is the standby router. That means I currently am handling all traffic destined for the VMAC, and incidentally also for the um, default gateway's IP address. So if somebody out here were try to we're going to try to ping 10111, it would go to here, not to here. Okay. So how does this work? Um, in terms of recovery contention, let's say, for example, that everybody's talking to the default gateway from uh, all of the hosts use the, the, um, the virtual uh, MAC address of the default gateway, right? So everybody's talking to that VMAC, and then something happens. Um, something happens where uh, the primary that was before uh, went offline briefly or lost connectivity briefly. And what happened was exactly what's supposed to happen. Router B here took control of the VMAC and now he's processing all the data for the VMAC, okay? In unmodified HSRP or VRRP, um, even after router A comes back up, router B maintains possession as the active and of the VMAC. Okay, in in unadulterated uh, um, HSRP, then router B would maintain possession of the VMAC. Now that's different for VRRP because VRRP will uh, cause the person who is the active before, depending on the settings, to take over again. With these settings, uh, it would uh, cause uh, router A to take over again automatically, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But with HSRP, router B would take over when router goes, goes away, and he would just stay the active router, processing all tra traffic for the VMAC. Okay? In this other scenario, um, it's a little bit more like VRRP. In this scenario, we have turned on the command preempt in router A. 
What this means is we have also changed router A so that his priority is higher than the priority of router B. And we've set, so we've said priority 101 and we've set preempt. Now preempt is automatically turned on in VRRP, but not HSRP. Um, in VRRP, we would have the same scenario we spoke of on the previous slide if the priority were identical on both devices. But if the priority of this device were higher than the priority of the other device, VRRP has preempt turned on automatically or by default. HSRP does not. But if I want router A here to be the active router in uh, the first hop redundancy protocol at all times, I have to do the uh, uh, configuration to make sure that's going to happen. So setting the priority higher and making sure that preempt is turn, turned on would cause router A to always be the active router for the default gateway and the VMAC whenever he's up and healthy. Okay. Now, we talked about spanning tree and now we're going to talk and then we talked about first hop redundancy protocols. Let's put it together. So spanning tree, as I said, spanning tree will, when it comes up, it will select a root bridge, a root bridge. Now, all of the switches in this environment are trying, trying to figure out the optimal path to the root bridge and the redundant paths will be blocked. So in this very simple scenario, switch two has been um, elected as the root bridge. Now, you can change this from using uh, kind of a willy-nilly everybody's created equal except MAC addresses and the MAC address being used as the tiebreaker. You can influence spanning tree to decide who is the root bridge. But let's just say in this case that we have uh, the election has caused switch two to be the root bridge. Switch one, having a connection directly to switch two, would say that's my best path to switch two and make that his designated port and switch two would refer to the port going to him as a root port. Same for switch three, his best path is directly to switch two. And so this redundant path in order to stop spanning tree uh, loops, would spanning tree would block this port. And so normal traffic would not be sent out of that port. Again, it's beautiful because there is no single point of failure, right? In that particular case, just in terms of everybody getting to switch to, I have redundant paths to switch to, and it automatically heals. If this path should go down, then this path will, autom spanning tree will automatically open this up and traffic from switch one could go through switch three to switch two. So it ensures kind of continuity of services in the event of a failure, and it is an automatic recovery mechanism. Okay, now let's put this together with the first hop redundancy protocol. So in this case, I have uh, the router on the left as the active router and the router on the right as the standby router. Okay, but as it happens in this election, the routing protocol or spanning tree protocol has made switch three the root bridge. Okay. Now let's put this together. Anybody who wants to go off of this subnet, okay, has to go through the router on the left. But in this case, spanning tree would send all traffic from switch one through switch three. Why? Because this is the root bridge and spanning tree calculated the best path to the root bridge, not to the HSRP active. So instead of having traffic go directly to switch two, that's blocked as is the path to switch four. So what we'd wind up with is uh, suboptimal pathing to get to the default gateway. Traffic from switch one would go through switch three and then switch two to get to uh, the MAC address of the default gateway which is living here on the router on the left. So I'd rather have the switch that's connected to the uh, 
active FHRP router, I would rather have that be the root. So in this case, if switch two is the root and the router on the left is the active router, well, my spanning tree calculation caused switch one to have a direct path to switch two. And switch three has a direct path to switch two. Switch four had no direct path at any time to switch two. So he would inevitably have to go either through switch three or switch one. And we just drew it going through switch three. But his most optimal path is going to go, go through an adjacent switch before he gets to switch two. <clears throat> so in this case, the traffic leaving PC1 to go to the gateway has a much more optimal path. And it can go from switch two directly to the default gateway. Okay, that's cool. Now we have a much better path to get to the default gateway. <clears throat> oh, but what about if I have an FHRP changeover? What if the router on the right becomes active and the router on the left becomes standby? Ooh, now switch two is still the root. So switch one's traffic would not be able to go as direct. All of a sudden, we'd have another suboptimal path. The traffic from switch one would have to go through switch two to get to switch three, which is connected to the active router. <clears throat> okay? So what can we do? Well, as I said a few minutes ago, what we can do is we can uh, optimize this by optimizing both spanning tree and the first hop redundancy protocol so that the root bridge is the one that's connected to the router that is going to be the, uh, the FHRP active most of the time. Okay, now how do we do that? We turn on preemption in the router that we want to be active and we give it a higher priority than the standby. That way, any time that router is alive, it will be the default gateway, okay? It will be the default gateway. So that is optimization. That means that for the majority of the time, this will be the, um, the um, spanning tree root. So the layer two environment would have developed the, or would have um, used pathing automatically that optimizes its path to switch two. And switch two is connected directly to the FHRP active most of the time. <clears throat> In the event that the standby router takes over once in a while because of a problem with the active, right, with the router on the left, let's say the router on the right takes over, then yes, there would be optimal pathing temporarily as traffic goes from switch two to switch three to get to that uh, default gateway. But that would self-heal as soon as uh, the router on the left comes back up again it will take over the active role and our optimal our layer two pathing will be optimized once more automatically okay so setting the <clears throat> these two things to work together is what this little uh presentation is about so setting your first hop redundancy protocol in conjunction with your spanning tree right optimizing both of them is what's going to give you the best pathing uh, in your layer two network in order to get out of your layer two network to your default. Way. Thank you very much. I'm Keith Edwards. I hope you enjoyed that and um, take care and we'll be doing more blogs in the future.